Howdy. Is SpongeBob on drugs? Is Bikini Bottom the result of nuclear fallout? And is Krabs responsible for the entire extinction of his species? Some of these fan theories have been just plain silly, while others have felt surprisingly likely and maybe even changed my perspective on the show. We'll go through and look at some of these today and see which we can disprove looking at the official series. So let's take a look together at the five worst and best SpongeBob theories. Yeah! And just a reminder, if you are the writer of one of these theories, please don't take my criticism to heart. I admire your creativity and your attempts to entertain others with your writing. I'm only criticizing the theory and certainly not you as a person. This video is all meant in good fun. Keep writing and keep being you. And just a quick thanks to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this video. Later on, I'll chat a bit about them. To be honest, I've actually been using them for years even before this sponsorship. But anyway, on to the countdown. For the fifth worst, the drug theory. So in this theory, as you might have gandered, five of the SpongeBob characters are each addicted to a different drug. Oh, come on, really? For SpongeBob, you can probably take a wild guess. That's right, he's addicted to shrooms. Supposedly because of his wild imagination, which is apparently similar to someone tripping out. Words to go. I don't know myself, I've never done drugs. And it chalks up his extreme happiness to having euphoria because of his shrooms. Come on! <laughs> the Mrs. Puffs and Mr. Krabs? Oh, apparently they're addicted to cocaine. The reasoning for this is apparently cocaine users can be very irritable and paranoid. And honestly, I do think that sums up Mrs. Puffs and Mr. Krabs to a T. Mr. Krabs is paranoia personified when it comes to his formula. I'll drop the charges if you give me the formula. Never you little ah! help! <gasps> and Mrs. Puffs is very paranoid about SpongeBob crashing her boat, and, you know, fair enough, understandably. Oh, SpongeBob! Why? As for irritability, well, try asking Krabs for a raise, or Jeebus forbid a refund. No, a dozen free glasses of water! I'll even put ice in it! No, come back! Oh, two dollars! Though I would argue Mrs. Puffs is almost supernaturally patient with SpongeBob after all these years. At this point, she's been trying to teach this guy the boat for like 22 years. <laughs> The fact that she still gets in the car with Spongebob at all after all these years is incredible patience. The theory proposes that Squidward is using medical heroin, since apparently heroin abusers can act quite similar to Squidward, such as avoiding eye contact, poor job performance, moodiness, and being deceptive. But personally, I think these are more signs of depression or hating his job, which are also really bad things. After all, he really lit up when he started living in Squidville. I think I'll take my bike today. And of course, Patrick. You can probably guess, he's suspected to smoke medical marijuana. Why? Well, he's practically the personification of medical marijuana. No, your other bottom! Don't you have to be stupid somewhere else? Not until four. He is ridiculously laid back, and it's almost certain he has the munchies. Because Patrick is always hungry and certainly munching on something. But personally, I think the fact that these characters aren't on drugs is part of what makes them such fascinating personalities. Myself, I'm not a fan of this theory, as I think it diminishes the character depth for someone like Spongebob. He's able to be chirpy and still perfectly drug-free. That's part of what makes him amazing. But that's just my opinion. Some people like this theory. And for the fifth best... The Nuclear Blast Theory. So as we all know, Spongebob takes place in Bikini Bottom. I feel at this point you'd be more surprised by me telling you water is wet. But what you might not know is that this undersea community is located underneath a real-life island called Bikini Atoll. Hang on, are they talking about that tiny, pathetic island we see on the surface all the time? That's Bikini Atoll? But it's such a small, pitiful lump of sand, I doubt anything's a toll on that thing. Hmm? That's not it? Oh, sorry, my bad. Okay, apparently this is Bikini Atoll. So back in 1946, the USA used Bikini Atoll for nuclear testing. And boy howdy, they ever go overboard here. They really blew this place half to hell. Even today, the Bikini Atoll is still uninhabitable. And yet, it's one of the world's most exclusive regions for diving. Over the years, many bombs were set off in Bikini Atoll. A particularly notable one was called Baker and detonated 27 meters underwater. And the theory states that Baker and the other nuclear blasts were responsible for mutating and hulkifying the Bikini Bottom crew, turning them into the hideous monsters we know today. Oh, look how horrifying they are. 
This actually feels like a plausible theory to me, because the show's actually already shown us evidence of mutation. In the episode Feral Friends, you might remember we do actually see all the characters turn into their original forms. Even Spongy becomes a perfectly regular sea sponge. The show is outright acknowledging these characters are not in their original forms. They're mutated somehow. You're welcome, Mr. Krabs. <laughs> Personally, I like this theory because it incorporates an element of reality into Bikini Bottom. It makes this nuclear mutation theory feel more plausible to me. And for the fourth worst... The Skin Theory. This is probably my most controversial choice because I know a lot of people really like this theory. And it certainly has plenty of, uh, detail. The original video is over an hour long, and I applaud the author and their efforts to put this theory together. But personally, I find the theory over hyperbolic and just a little silly. So technically, skin theory isn't really a theory, but people seem to classify it as one. It's instead the name of many cases of SpongeBob characters being seen wearing and removing suits and false body parts. Wow. I'm a pet goldfish in a bowl. And basically how this behavior is seen as normal in Bikini Bottom, despite many of the costumes being other fish. So it's just my opinion, but I think there was way too much overblown hyperbole to this theory. And it kind of got under my skin. <laughs> uh. For example, Squidward wears a salmon suit during the episode Dying for Pie, which the theory claims is like someone coming up to you in the hollowed out skin of another human? Why? But it's not a dead hollowed out salmon. It's, it's quite clearly a suit, and human suits are honestly not that uncommon. Some of these suits in particular might look a little familiar to you. Sure, you might not think all these suits look good, but I certainly don't think they're a hollowed out human. The theory's other apparent example of a skin fish is in Chocolate with Nuts, where the con man fools Spongy and Patrick. Afterwards, he unzips what looks to be a skin-tight latex suit. <laughs> and again, we have these in our world too, but it's perfectly understandable if you don't know where to find them. They're generally in uh, specialty shops. Sure, they might look a little creepy, but they're not examples of being people being skinned. Ugh. Probably the most plausible example I found of someone actually wearing another creature as a suit was in Shell of a Man, where Krabs is in an accident and loses his shell. And SpongeBob wears his old shell and pretends to be Krabs. Like pineapple, I live in one. <laughs> There's also someone's in the kitchen with Sandy. This would be another good example. It's actually a common misconception to see a bunch of crab shells on the beach and assume it's a mass grave of crabs. In reality, these crabs have simply shed their skin and left them behind. This episode comes from season four, so maybe Mr. Helberg was just trying to teach us about marine biology? Anyway, to keep this within a healthy time frame for this countdown, I'll give one more example. In the episode, I had an accident, you might remember that Patrick wears a gorilla suit, but later a gorilla is wearing a Patrick costume. But again, in this case, Patrick costumes are nothing unusual. In fact, some of them I've seen actually look pretty convincing. So it doesn't really surprise me that someone could be wearing a Patrick costume. Again though, props to the author Doug for all the effort they put into this theory. Although I personally dislike this theory, if you are curious, I've left a link to the full video in the description. And for the fourth best... Cannibal Crabs. In this theory, we propose that SpongeBob may well be working for a cannibal. As the theory states that the secret of the Krabby Patty formula is in fact that they're made of crab meat. Krabby Patties are made out of crab! For example, things on the menu such as the kelp shake are literally made of kelp. So why wouldn't something like the Krabby Patty be made of crab? We're never actually told where the meat comes from, and you would be surprised how much evidence there is behind this theory. So let me explain what makes this theory so unusually plausible. Part of what sets fire to this theory is apart from crabs and his mum and dad, have we ever seen another crab on this show? The closest thing I can think of is Larry, and he's a lobster. The theory also points out that the Krusty Krab restaurant takes the shape of an actual crab trap. And I've got to admit, it does look really similar. But probably the most interesting piece of evidence I found of the theory is I don't actually remember crabs ever eating a Krabby Patty, except in the one episode Midlife Crustacean. And what does he say when he bites the Krabby Patty? Hmm, so that's what I taste like. I don't know, maybe it's out of context, but didn't Krabs just state he literally tastes like a Krabby Patty? That seems like fairly decent evidence. Mommy, 
My Krabby Patty tastes funny. Well, no wonder. In fact, the evidence was so strong that Nickelodeon themselves have debunked this theory. Nickelodeon states it's outright incorrect. But wrong or not, in theory, it would explain a lot. Uh, don't get me wrong, I don't want Krabs to be grinding up his own species into patties. I just think this theory has an amazing amount of plausible evidence to it. And for a theory about Krabs being a cannibal, that's pretty good effort. And for the third worst... The Death Theory. While I do think this theory is interesting and creative, I found a lot of evidence against it in the actual episodes. I just don't think this theory is even close to watertight. So at one point you may have thought, hey, why is SpongeBob acting stupider in later seasons than he did in seasons one to four? I have just enough air in my submarine to get to the surface and refill my air tank. Allow me to get the door. <laughs> While I don't think this applies in Seasons 10 plus as much, this was a really fair question. Particularly around Season 6. Ugh. This theory proposes that the original Spongebob actually died in the first movie, way back in 2004. Back when he was being roasted by that diver in the seaside shop. I don't even think we're gonna be able to save ourselves, buddy. It's known as the famous death scene from the original movie. And this is where the theory gets weird. Since sea sponges can reproduce without a mate, the theory is that the new stupider SpongeBob is an offspring of the old SpongeBob. They also propose this is why SpongeBob doesn't age. Personally though, I feel this theory is so full of holes that we could double it as a slice of Swiss cheese. For starters, if this is a new SpongeBob, how does he remember everything from seasons one to four? Also, we have seen SpongeBob and his relatives age before. His grandma looks pretty Pretty old. It's even implied one of his relatives passed of old age. In the episode Spongebuck Squarepants, we discover Spongebob's long-lost relative existed in Bikini Bottom between 1860 and 1890. It's implied he's passed since then. It's a statue of Spongebuck Squarepants! I've never even heard of him! We also see proof that Spongebob ages in the episode The Great Patty Caper, where he's shown to be looking older 75 years in the future. Yeah, big kids today! Also, this theory doesn't take into account that Squidward, Sandy, and Patrick don't age either. Also, I think it's a severe oversimplification to call modern SpongeBob stupid all the time. I think he's a bit more like Homer in that he sometimes presents surprising insight and intelligence. This happens particularly in Seasons 10 Plus, when Mr. Hilberg tried to get SpongeBob back on track. But certainly, in Seasons 5 to 9 particularly, sometimes he can seem monumentally stupid. On top of all this counter-evidence, part of me simply doesn't like the theory. I don't like the idea that Spongebob died and we've just been watching a brand new character this whole time. I'm more invested in Spongebob because I know I've been watching the same guy that walked in at probably around 14 or so into the Krusty Krab to get his job way back in 1999. And I like to think this season one Spongebob has been living in the town ever since. Sure, he can have his off days, but he's still the spongy we know. And before we get to the third best, I just wanted to quickly mention about my sponsors, ExpressVPN. They enable online users worldwide to protect their privacy and their security with just a few clicks. I try to be as transparent as possible with you, and honestly, I have been using ExpressVPN for years, even before this sponsorship. You see, so much content is blocked in my country. For example, I had to use ExpressVPN just to watch the first episode of Camp Coral on the Nickelodeon YouTube channel. Because even though Nickelodeon was offering it for free, it was still blocked in Australia for reasons, I don't know. But after I started using ExpressVPN, I had the entire internet without restrictions in just one click. Plus my privacy was well protected because they used the best in class encryption for all my internet data. And whether I want to choose Germany, the UK, the US, there's over 90 countries to choose from. You can find out how to get three months of ExpressVPN for free by visiting expressvpn.com slash phantomstrider or by clicking the link in the description below. Thank you for your patience. And now onto the third best, the Sandy Biologist Theory. This theory really connects seamlessly into the Bikini Bottom world. Frankly, it's one of the few theories that feels absolutely possible, and I wouldn't be surprised if the creators didn't discount it. They'd of course deny that Krabs is a cannibal. But how about the simple idea that Sandy is actually a marine biologist? The theory proposes that it's her job to observe and study the Bikini Bottom citizens for the weird anomalies they are. We know she's a scientist, so her being a marine biologist doesn't seem far-fetched at all. The idea is that she was sent down to Bikini Bottom to observe 
observe and test the rare fish that live there. Maybe she's looking at mutations after the 1946 nuclear testing. Maybe she's a friend of Stephen Hilberg. Amazingly, even this idea holds surprising weight. I mean, we already know she's a friend of Tom Kenny in the episode Feral Friends. It's me, Sandy! Ah, uh, Sandy Cheeks. How is it hanging? Why not Steven Hilberg? He's a marine biologist. This almost feels like a potential prequel for the show rather than a far-fetched theory. Like, maybe we get the origins of Sandy. Like, maybe we get the real origins of Sandy. Like, one that isn't a last-minute retcon of a character with 20 years of pre-established history. I'd be interested to see where Sandy actually came from. All we know is that she's a scientist from Texas. We also know that Sandy very regularly communicates with the land. She even goes to visit on occasions for something as casual as a rodeo. I think this idea is interesting, and it would make SpongeBob and Sandy's slowly blooming friendship even more sweet. Sandy goes underwater to observe this supposedly mutated sea sponge. And as they get to know each other better, they end up becoming best friends and going on some very weird road trips together. Y'all are the best aquatic critter friends a lone star from out of town could ever have. And I think the second worst theory is... SpongeBob was brainwashed? Shapeless. This one is a pretty campy, silly idea. It feels like it's been repeatedly disproven by the show for like 10 years. So if we go back to the episode Squilliam Returns, you might remember, at Squidward's request, SpongeBob cleared his mind. Empty my mind. AKA, we watch his brain do somersaults to erase everything he knows except breathing and fine dining. And, well, for that episode, it works. SpongeBob becomes the perfect waiter, completely blowing Squidward and Squilliam away with his skills. Unfortunately, this quickly becomes a disaster disaster as Spongebob can't remember anything except breathing and fine dining. All because he, uh, cleared his mind. This theory proposes that Spongebob never recovered from this. The reasoning? Because Spongebob acted very differently after season 3 ended. So let's poke this theory so full of holes it looks like a holy mackerel. To start with, in that exact same episode at the end, Spongebob appears to be relatively back to normal after his outburst. But understandably, he's nursing a splitting headache. He's relatively coherent and it's implied he's back to normal after his previous meltdown. In fact, he's perfectly back to normal in the very next episode episode. In Crabborg, he appears to have completely recovered from the trauma he had on that stressful day. After that, Spongebob is back in full force for the rest of Season 3. He's still working at the Krusty Krab, he's taking care of Gary, he's playing silly games with Patrick, and everything else that he loves doing. In fact, he seems completely back to normal by the movie, where he had to go to Shell City to return Neptune's crown. And in between Squilliam Returns and the movie, we've had episodes like Party Pooper Pants, where Spongebob clearly demonstrates he has no skill in fine dining, as he tries to destroy his own party. And again, on a personal level, this theory just doesn't take my fancy. Similar to the death theory, I like to think I'm looking at the quirky, but fully coherent and mentally sound Spongebob I've known for many years. Anyway, that's just my thoughts. One more crack like that and you're out of here! For the second best... <laughs> the Seven Deadly Sins Theory. Huh. This one actually got addressed and responded to by Tom Kenny himself. In fact, this seems to be one of the most unanimously enjoyed SpongeBob theories on the internet. And I have to admit, a lot of it does match up really well. The idea is that each of SpongeBob's seven friends represent one of the seven deadly sins. Let's start with the obvious. What sin could Krabs possibly be? Why greed, of course. I just sweet talked an old lady out of 20 bucks for a Krabby Patty! For his rival Plankton, Envy. Plankton is ridiculously envious of Krabs' success with the Krabby Patty. I think that much is obvious by now. I mean, it's reached the point where Plankton has dedicated his life to this envy. You better cough up that secret formula or else! As for Patrick, well, Sloth, of course. He's lazily lazy enough that Lazy Town decided to exile him for being too lazily lazy. He's lazy. Karate power! Go. As for Squidward, the theory proposes that he's wrath. And he certainly can get angry a lot of the time. You're the worst neighbors ever! I'm all out of money! I can safely say I've seen more wrath on Squidward than any other character in the show. Sandy supposedly represents pride. And once again, I think that's very accurate. It's very clear in a lot of episodes she takes great pride in her science and just about everything she does. Even in her personal hobbies like karate. Yeah. Nice try, Sponge Brain. 
The last two actually have two options, if we can include SpongeBob as one of the seven deadly sins. Gary is the representation of gluttony. And I gotta admit, of almost every scene we see of Gary, he's munching away on his food. Dogs in particular don't know when to stop eating. You put food in front of them, they'll eat it. It's just part of their brain chemistry. There was another option for gluttony with Mrs. Puff, but I think this one's vague at best. I honestly have never associated Mrs. Puff with eating. As for her size, isn't that because she's a puffer fish? She could also have a slow metabolism or Hashimoto's, I don't know. I don't remember seeing her eat too often, so let's call Gary the best fill-in. As for lust, well, this is where it gets kind of weird. Apparently, SpongeBob is a possible fill-in for lust. I can't let them eat you! Your beauty must be preserved! I mean, looking at how he acted in To Love a Patty, I, I guess he could be called lustful. No judgement, but he certainly does seem to have that personal fixation on patties there. The other fill-in they had for lust was Pearl, as she often seems to have an interest in boys. But to be fair, almost any living creature in their teens could pass the category of lust. Mind you, we could probably discount lust altogether, because Nickelodeon would probably deem it inappropriate in a kid's show. Some people complain that the seven deadly sin theory can be applied to almost any cartoon character cast, but I do feel the Spongebob crew line up with these sins mostly pretty dang well. It's a fan favourite theory and it makes me think of the cast in a whole new way, so I'm going to put this theory as one of the best. And I think the number one worst Spongebob theory is... Squidward's nose is actually a... John Thomas. Just when I thought they couldn't get any stupider. Oh boy, a theory from a Tumblr page talking about Squidward's... Peewee Herman. Now obviously, this theory's really stupid, but astonishingly enough, it does have one piece of evidence. So let's give this train wreck of a theory a look. So you might know, according to Mr. Hilberg, Squidward's an octopus. And a cephalopod such as Squidward is distinctive for his bulbous head. But a significantly out of place feature on Squidward is his strange looking nose. And the thing about octopi that makes them rather unique is their reproductive organs are on their head. These organs are near their beak. So the theory proposes that Squidward's beak is really his one-eyed trouser snake. I didn't realize it was happy hopping moron day. And if you think about it, well, he does wear a shirt with no pants and not many other people in the show do that. Why is this? Because why would he bother covering his shame down there when he doesn't have any shame to cover? That's really about all the evidence we've got. But I gotta say, for a theory about Squidward's meat and two veg, this has a surprising amount of evidence behind it. Wow, I never thought of it that way. And props to the author for giving many viewers a cheeky smile with their writing. And I can safely say say after reading this that I will never look at Squidward's strangely shaped nose ever again. And yes, I'm still calling it his nose. Yes, it is still his nose. It, why would they do that? Ugh. And I think the number one best SpongeBob theory is Squidward is SpongeBob's guardian. Ah, this theory's kind of nice. And again, when I think about it, it has a surprising amount of evidence to it. And it would explain away just so many holes in the show's logic. Though I do have a personal bias to this one, as I think it'd be a really cool plot twist in the show. We could easily ask the question, why hasn't Squidward just moved or quit his job working next to Spongebob? Apart from the episode Squidville, I don't think he's ever moved away. And he clearly only tolerates Spongebob, so what gives? Well, this theory proposes that Spongebob's parents are actually quite wealthy. And when Spongy moved out, they hired Squidward to keep an eye on him just to make sure he's safe. This would also explain how Spongebob and Squidward are able to afford to keep working at the Krusty Krab. After all, in the episode Big Pink Loser, Spongebob tells Patrick that Mr. Krab charges him $50 an hour to work there. And at $50 an hour too. When I started working here, I had to pay Mr. Krabs $100 an hour. I don't know if Krabs is going to continue to charge Spongebob in the later episodes. Maybe it's a uniform tax or something. But it's certainly implied in many other episodes. The two get paid very little for their job. So how otherwise could Spongebob and Squidward afford to eat and pay bills? They're living by themselves in their own plots of land in Bikini Bottom. Maybe that's why no one else works at the Krusty Krab. 
because Squidward's kept afloat by SpongeBob's parents in his carer role, and SpongeBob's kept afloat by his parents. It would also explain how SpongeBob was able to live alone when he first came to Bikini Bottom in 1999. He may be over 34 now, but if we look at his driver's license, when he first came to Bikini Bottom in 1999, he was like 14. And it's hard to imagine parents leaving their child like financially destitute at 14. I'm not saying this doesn't happen, and it's tragic if it does, but I'm just saying it's not that common in this show. Perhaps though, as the theory proposes, SpongeBob's parents just wanted to give him some independence. And since they're loaded, they gave him a house next to his carer Squidward in Bikini Bottom. This one's a bit more vague, but it'd also explain why Squidward went to find SpongeBob in the third movie. This little nattering nudge He's my friend, and he doesn't deserve to die. And unlike the first two movies, there wasn't an apocalyptic event to distract him. And when I look back on most of the Krusty Krab outings I remember, like the pizza delivery episode, or Random Land, or when they're cleaning up the junk from the city, considering the amount of episodes that show Squidward and SpongeBob protecting each other, I wouldn't be surprised if this theory turned out to be a plot twist. Well, okay, I would be surprised, but you know, in a good way. It, it would make fairly logical sense. Personally, I could see this being an amazing plot twist at the end of the series. And to me, it's my absolute favorite SpongeBob theory. But as I said, I appreciate all the authors whose work took part in this video. And good or bad, I hope they keep doing creative writing in the future. And if you've got your own thoughts on these theories, it'd be great to hear from you. Feel free to leave your own thoughts in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Apologies in advance for this random weird picture of me. My dad really wanted me for some reason to post this picture of me at the finish line in the recent um, marathon in the mountains I did. So here you go, dad. All right.